guys, and welcome back to my channel. This beautiful book, published in Britain in 1979, fascinated and captivated the world with its promise that within its pages contained clues to an actual buried treasure, the treasure being an 18 karat golden hair. The treasure hunt alone is enough for a story, but the real drama is everything that happened before, during, and after the hair was found. We're talking disguises, aliases, cryptic letters, midnight digs, conspiracies, and of course, lots and lots of puzzling. Just some quick little housekeeping before we dive in. One, sources, description box, you get it. Two, I refer to everyone by their last names mostly, <laughs> except for Kit Williams and people who I don't know how to pronounce. That's, I just, letting you know. And three, I will be swearing in this video. This should not be surprised because I always swear, but like some grandparents or parents might find this video and send it to their kids, so like, Fair warning, this video may be about a children's book, but they are not the intended audience. With that out of the way, let's begin our story. Setting the stage. The year is 1976. Tom Mashler was the chief editor of the publishing company, Jonathan Cape, and he was on the prowl for the next bestseller. He was already something of a celebrity, having made Catch-22 a literary sensation, and by publishing work by soon-to-be famous authors, including Roald Dahl, Bruce Chatwin, Ian McEwan, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and more. He noticed that there was a growing market for children's books with highly detailed illustrations. Tiger Voyage, The Butterfly Ball, and Grasshopper's Feast had all done remarkably well for the Cape Publishing Company, and Mashler wanted to find a new artist up for the task. Eric Lister, owner of an art gallery called The Portal, had debuted some work by an up-and-coming artist a few years prior, which Mashler himself had also attended. No one knows who came up with the idea first, but Lister and Mashler had the same crazy idea. What if we asked him to create a children's book? Lister reached out to the artist, they arranged a little lunch date, and on a typically Britishly overcast day in March 1976, he and Mashler set off to the rural town of Gloucestershire, I don't know how to pronounce it, to meet none other than our main character, Kit. Who is Kit Williams? Kit Williams, born April 28, 1946, a Taurus, is an English artist, illustrator, and writer, but honestly, I don't know if those words do justice. <laughs> He's an eccentric creator who transports his audience into fantastical and whimsical worlds through oil painting, marquetry, sculpture, animatronics, metalworking, whatever it takes to achieve his vision. And speaking of vision, <laughs> let's address the elephant in the room. His eyes, they're pointing in two different directions. You'd think that it's just a lazy eye, but no, that's not it. You guys aren't ready for this. Kit Williams trained his eyes to be ambidextrous. <laughs> He's so skilled with his eyes that he just lives his life seeing two separate perspectives at all times. He literally drives with one eye on the road and one eye on the mirror. It's fucking insane and frankly tells you all you need to know about his personality, but oh my God, there's more. <laughs> Kit has been a creator his entire life. As a kid, he built a boat with his dad, he built radios from scratch, and he even made a TV using an orange crate as the main structure and knitting needles for knobs. He's very logical and methodical, but he also has a flair for the romantics, and those competing interests in engineering and sentimentalism brought 15-year-old Kit to the most obvious conclusion. Join the Navy. <laughs> When I went down to the sea in ships, I thought it was a very romantic thing to do. I was at sea for four years and I thought, I can't go any further with these electronics. I decided to become a philosopher and I went to the ship's library and took out all the books on philosophy I could find and started reading them. After four days, I decided I wouldn't become a philosopher. So I started painting and never looked back. I mean, sure, you can just choose your life's work that way. Why not, Kit, why not? <laughs> Anyway, his work. All of Kit's paintings have this very intense, hyper-realistic quality, and he pays attention to every little possible detail. This realism juxtaposes with the very surreal quality of his compositions, the way his subjects are frozen in time, even as they're falling out of or climbing into the painting. To create these optical illusions, Kit built all of the canvases by hand, making every piece truly unique and unforgettable. He's very much a Renaissance man, which allows him to be very hands-on in all parts of the process. Yeah, he does make the frames, but this guy goes as far as sewing costumes and making props for his models to use. Like, that's either an insane dedication to the craft or insanity, and with Kit Williams, it could easily be both. <laughs> A spark of an idea. Pretty much the second Lister and Mashler entered Kit's moss-covered abode, Kit was already declining their offer of making a children's book. 
For one thing, he wasn't a writer, and he hated the idea of painting the same characters over and over again. And for another, much bigger reason, he hated how people just kind of absentmindedly flip through books without taking the time to look at the artwork. Especially with how detailed his work is, it just makes a lot more sense to be hanging it in a gallery. After a lot of back and forth, Mashler and Lister were finally like, this is going nowhere, and they headed for the door. But right as he was about to leave, Mashler said, it's a pity about the book. I think you could do something that no one's ever done before, a book that would have caught the imagination of the world. But never mind. <laughs> and that, my friends, are fighting words. Kit smelled a challenge. <laughs> oh my god. But how was he going to produce a book like no other? And more importantly, how was he going to make it in a way that creatively satisfied him? The first issue to tackle was the whole people not stopping to look at the art problem. I thought, right, there should be something hidden in the pictures. That way, instead of saying this is art, I can say this is a puzzle. And they look at it not because it's art, they're not frightened by any art in the thing, they're looking for something else. They're looking for a puzzle. It's sort of like going in through the back door. If I'm going to paint for three years solid and put all this work into it, I've got to make people stop and look and look again and look again. But if it was going to be a puzzle, there needed to be a prize. Something so valuable and so tempting that people just couldn't resist trying the puzzle for themselves. I thought it'd be nice to really, really bury treasure. Actually put gold in the cold, wet earth. And finally came the story itself. The story is basically the sun and the moon are in love, but can never see each other for obvious reasons. The moon creates a love token and asks Jack the Hare to bring it to the sun. Somewhere along the way, Jack loses the moon's treasure, and it's the reader's job to find it, literally. It took Kit about three months to fully flesh out his ideas, and by that point, Mashler had just figured this wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> so imagine his surprise when he gets a call from Kit. One day, the telephone rang and Williams was on it. He was saying, Oh, the treasure, and the moon, and the sun, and the stars, and, and, and a hair, and I need the money. I need 3,000 pounds to buy the gold. And then there's a puzzle, but I don't know what it is yet. And so on. I mean, he sounded like a madman. And as insane as his idea was, Mashler was interested. Especially because this idea of a treasure hunt sounded like sales, baby. Cash money. So without even knowing all the details of how the puzzle would be solved, he greenlit the project, gave Kit the money he needed to sculpt the golden hair, and looked forward to the no doubt literary sensation that would be finished in three years time. Creating Masquerade. So, Masquerade. Let's get a bit more acquainted with this book, shall we? On the very first page is the book's challenge. Within the pages of this book, there is a story told of love, adventures, fortunes lost, and a jewel of solid gold. To solve the hidden riddle, you must use your eyes and find the hair in every picture that may point you to the prize. That's basically the only clue, hint, anything we get from Kit as to how to solve this puzzle. There's literally no other information as to like where to start or what to look for, nothing. All you have is the story and the illustrations. Each page in the story includes a riddle because every character speaks in riddles, and in every illustration there's a hair somewhere hidden in there. Some are very obvious, but others are actually really difficult to find. And this decision to add riddles and hidden hairs is really freaking smart because even if you have no interest in solving the main puzzle, you still have to slow down to fully enjoy everything the book has to offer. So we don't get any insight as to how to solve the puzzle, but you don't have to look too hard to find some odd quirks to the illustrations. For example, example, these weird squares full of numbers and letters, or the vague text that wraps around the artwork. The illustrations are so detailed and so deliberate that you can't help but feel like if you looked a little harder, you'll find something new. Now, we know that the puzzle is difficult to solve, and when I explain the solution later in the video, you're gonna be screaming, but what makes it even more challenging are all the goddamn red herrings. <laughs> For example, the story itself. You would think that there'd be some hints in the text, but you actually don't need the story to solve the main puzzle, only the illustrations. Another example is the weird little square we see in the Flower Girl illustration. Those numbers are actually atomic numbers, like the periodic table, and when you spell them out, you get false. Now think again. Bastard. <laughs> 
but all of this head scratching is worth it because the prize really is exquisite. The golden hair, hand sculpted by Kit of course, is made out of 18 karat gold and dangling from its little filigree belly are golden bells and tiny sculpted animals. The whole thing measures about 5 inches in length and can be worn as a necklace. Before the hair was buried, it was sealed inside a clay pot which bore the inscription, I am the keeper of the jewel of masquerade which lies safe inside me for you or eternity. The clay pot not only protected this very delicate creation, but also prevented treasure hunters from using metal detectors to find it. Clever. I said earlier that there were no clues to solving the puzzle, but there were some stipulations and rules that kind of helped a little bit. For one thing, you did not need to physically dig up the hair to win. All you had to do was mail the puzzle's answers to Kit, which the address was printed in the book, and he'd fly you over so that you could both dig it up together. This made it at least slightly more fair for international readers to join in. We also know that the hair is buried in Britain, though Kit stipulates that you don't need to know British geography to solve it. We also know that it was buried on public property, aka no need to be in a cage and break in somewhere. We also know that the solution is incredibly precise and that with the puzzle's answer, you could find where the hair was buried down to the inch. There also was no time limit. This was strictly whoever finds it first. Kit boldly claims on the back of this book that the riddle could be solved by a child of 10 as easily as by a college graduate, which to be fair is technically true, but is a stretch. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was only after the hair was buried that anyone in the world had any idea how challenging this puzzle really is. Buried treasure. With the book completed and the publication date set, all that was left were a few publicity rounds and of course, burying the golden hair. At this point, no one, not even Mashler, knew how the puzzle was solved and where the hair would be buried. Everything was operated on pure blind faith. Bachelor trusted Kit to come up with something brilliant and solvable, and surely he had delivered, right? <laughs> but they couldn't have just Kit be the keeper of the puzzle. They needed at least one other person, someone not involved with the project, to be an honest witness to the treasure being buried and to testify that the puzzle was in fact solvable. The person they chose to be the witness was Bamber Gascoin. Gascoigne? I don't know his last name, we're gonna go by Bamber. He was a well-liked and well-respected television presenter. From what I understand, he did shows that were like on the intelligent side. So picture like Alex Trebek or Bill Nye the Science Guy. So in the dead of night on August 7th, 1979, Bamber and Kit set off in Kit's beat up plumber van to go bury the treasure. As they're driving, Kit starts rambling about how the puzzle is solved and Bamber's excitement turns to, oh shit. Kit had explained to me the basis of his puzzle, but even with that privileged information, I was unable to make it work out. The cause of my growing uneasiness was the thought that if it was in fact impossibly difficult, then I was the only person in the world in a position to form that opinion. Kit considered it very possible, even perhaps dangerously easy, because he himself had invented it. Which is like, no! Kit, that's not how this works! <gasps> So as poor Bamber is like grappling with this burden of information, they arrive at Amped Hill, home of the Queen Catherine of Aragon monument. The solution to the puzzle and where the hair was to be buried was at the tip of the monument's shadow at noon on the spring equinox. So without even knowing how the puzzle is solved, do you already understand the panic that Bamber is feeling? Anyway, in preparation for this moment, Kit had buried a magnet at the precise spot a few years earlier. So even in the dead of night, it wasn't hard for Kit to find the burying spot. He dug a deep hole, taking very great care with the layer of grass on top, buried it, carefully put the ground back together, poured some water over the top to kind of settle the dirt. Then as a finishing touch, he goes back to his van and brings back a Tupperware full of fucking cow patty and places it on top, which means the whole time <laughs> that Bamber was in the car panicking about being the only person on earth who genuinely understands how insane this puzzle is, there was a fucking cow patty in a Tupperware in the van. I can't make this shit up. So Bamber was a nuts about this and he seriously considered telling Mashler to call the whole thing off. But in the end he was like, we're in too deep. Let's just fucking see what happens and prayed that somehow everything would work out. Now the hair's been buried. It's up to you to find it. Hot off the press. 
Masquerade was an immediate and unprecedented success. Mashler had 60,000 books printed for the publication day, but by that afternoon, he had to order another 50,000. Over a million copies flew off the shelves all over the world, selling 600,000 in England, 400,000 in the US, 80,000 in Japan, 30,000 in Germany, 10,000 in the Netherlands, and 5,000 in France. The fact that the book did so well in non-English speaking countries is honestly mind boggling for me because the puzzle is very dependent on the English language. And because Kit painted the words around the illustrations, it was even more impossible to translate. But clearly, this did not stop people from obsessing over the book. The only country that had anything to say about translation was Italy, who came forward and asked if they could make their own Italian version. Masquerade was retitled to Il Tesoro di Mascarade. The entire book was reinvented with a brand new puzzle, and they even buried their own prize in Italy under the foot of Monte Rosso al Mare, which apparently was significantly easier to solve, by the way. <laughs> so, Kit becomes an international celebrity, with every newspaper, TV show, and publication just clamoring for an interview. By the time of a two-week promotional tour of the United States in September of 1980, he had taken to wearing bright green leprechaun shoes below a kaleidoscopic wardrobe and prancing around like the magical little four sprite his hosts on the morning show circuit so dearly wanted him to be, complete with bushy red hair, bright red beard, and that disconcerting wandering eye. <laughs> so now, with the book launched and the sales skyrocketing, all that was left to do was find their winner. You've got mail. In the two and a half years it took Masquerade to be solved, Kit never knew peace. <laughs> Every single day, 200 letters from around the world would be delivered to his home, and because any one of those letters could potentially have cracked the puzzle, Kit had no choice but to go through every single one. All this time combing through every letter left Kit with almost no time to paint. Treasure hunters would occasionally show up at Kit's door, sometimes in the middle of the night to ask questions and dig around his property. Because Gloucestershire is such a small town and because Kit had become quite the celebrity, the townsfolk would cheerfully tell these treasure hunters, oh, Kit Williams? Oh, he lives 10 miles up north. <laughs> It was a legit community effort to keep these people away. The solutions spanned a wide range from painfully detailed to the absolute absurd. The Brits were far more likely to mail in essay long answers, diving into a rabbit hole of false leads and red herrings. One answer Kit received was seven pages long and wove together a tapestry of historical references and other random findings that Kit himself couldn't even comprehend what he was reading. And the Americans, on the other hand, were just more likely to straight up guess, hoping that if they slung enough spaghetti at the walls, something would stick. No better example of this would be a woman in Wyoming who got the idea to mail every possible geographical coordinate in England, hoping to stumble upon an answer. She spent at least $1,000 just on postage and still never got close to Amtail. And then, of course, there were just the packages that were clearly meant to fuck with Kit. I got sort of nasty things through the post, like severed rubber hands with blood, and there was some strange American occasionally would send me his breakfast, the cornflakes, the milk, and everything in a sealed box. And you'd think, I don't really like this. This is getting a bit nasty. About a year into this madness, Kit and his publishers were starting to sweat. All these responses from all over the world, and still no one was even close. Finally, on December 21st, 1980, Kit published an illustration in The Times, which was the one and only clue ever given. We'll come back to this illustration later, but first, let's meet some new characters. It needs a couple of physicists. Mike Barker and John Rousseau met when they were both research physicists at Shellfield University and kept their friendship up even when they both moved on to teaching physics at Lancashire schools. They were introduced to Masquerade on New Year's Day 1981, when their two families gathered at Rousseau's home. His daughters were attempting to crack some of the anagrams and the rest of the family just kind of found themselves drawn into the puzzle. Rousseau was particularly excited to investigate the book's mysteries and told Barker, we'll be the ones to do this. It needs a couple physicists. <laughs> Honestly, I find this quote really amusing because the idea that a puzzle book would need two college physics professors to solve it feels like overkill, but you'll see. <laughs> They were a bit too overeager in the beginning, and like most treasure hunters, they went digging in the wrong places. After a few dead ends, they went back to their scientific roots and took a more calculated, more meticulous approach. First, they figured out Kit's supplemental clue, the one in December that he had just published. In one hand, Kit is holding a fish labeled A6000. For these two, specifically, this was easy to figure out. 6,000 ants 
Angstroms, commonly abbreviated to A6000, represents the red wavelength of the spectrum. And since the fish depicted was a herring, this meant that the clue was a literal red herring. In my opinion, Kit is an asshole for this because no one in the world has solved your puzzle and it's been a year. This is your one and only clue and you still can't resist putting in a red herring. Like, honestly, it pisses me off. Anyway, what about the weird symbols on the paper Kit is holding? What the hell is that? Let me remind you that this illustration was published in a newspaper, aka the paper was very thin and slightly translucent. Barker and Rousseau figured out that if you fold the illustration in half, hold it up to a mirror and shine a light through the back, you get this message. To do my work, one AD, one five men from 10, 20? The tallest and the fattest and the righteous follow the sinister. Which, okay, cool, they figured out, yay. But what the fuck does that mean? After a few misattempts at understanding the illustration, they went back to this message and cleaned it up a little. To do my work, I appointed four men from 20, the tallest and the fattest, and the righteous followed the sinister. Four men from 20 refers to the four digits from one's 20 total fingers and toes. The tallest and the fattest would therefore specifically reference one's middle finger and big toes. If the righteous follows the sinister, which is referencing that general Latin idea that right is good and left is bad, that means that the left hand or foot would come before the right hand or foot. This probably doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't to Barker and Rousseau at first, but they kept their findings in the back of their minds when they went back to studying, you know, the original literature. They then noticed similarities between two magic squares, the first located in the Penny Pockets page and the second in the Sir Isaac Newton page. Magic squares are grids of numbers that produce the same total vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. In this case, the Penny Pocket square totals up to a consistent 34. The weird thing though, is that Kit left one square blank, which is crucial because the Sir Isaac Newton square has the same blank square. This told Barker and Rousseau that the numbers in the penny pocket somehow correlated with the colors and letters in Sir Isaac Newton. So here we go. Let's match these babies. Starting with the top left corner, we have the number 16, which matches with a blue EY. Next, the number three matches with a green C. You go down the line, matching up all the numbers, letters, and colors. When you rearrange the numbers to be in ascending order, you'll notice a repeating pattern of colors, red, yellow, green, blue. The blank square hex it up because there's a missing green, but whatever, you can clearly see a pattern. And it's also the same pattern on Penny Pocket's skirt. Ah. The letters and the numbers we just found are important too, but we'll get to them later. For now, we need to focus on the colors. Looking at Newton's puppets, you'll notice that these same four colors are on the rings of his fingers. On both figures, red connects with the left hand, yellow connects with the left foot, green connects with the right foot, and blue connects with the right hand. Since the bonus clue Kit gave us references fingers and toes, we can be even more specific with left middle finger, left big toe, right big toe, and right middle finger. Because Kit's Christmas clue correlates perfectly with the color body part pattern thing in the book, Barker and Rousseau knew that they had to be on the right track. Some of you may already have an idea of where this is going, but I want to zoom out a little bit. Barker and Rousseau said that this book needed a couple of physicists to solve it, and some articles I've read online claim that there is no way anyone could have solved this without being shown how, but I vehemently disagree. And in fact, I'm going to be even a little bit bolder. I think that most artists actually have an advantage in noticing some very helpful clues. Okay, first up. When you look at kids' illustrations, what's the first obvious thing that connects them all? The borders, right? Every illustration has this kind of stone border with text along the sides. With the exception of the first illustration, the text doesn't really mean anything. You'll notice that some letters are red and some letters have barbs, which do anagram into secret words. But the words you find are only vague hints and they don't actually do anything to solve the main puzzle. But look closer. Graphic designers, what do you notice? If you said shit kerning and sizing, you would be correct. <laughs> Some words are cramped along the sides while others in the same painting are weirdly stretched out, which is really, really odd because we can clearly see that Kit's meticulous in his work. Each painting takes Kit 800 hours to make. So why is he being so sloppy with the letters? Next, illustrators. What's the number one most annoying and difficult thing to draw on the human body? Hands. And if we look at these illustrations closer, you'll notice that the fingers are kind of odd. Like who the hell falls with their fingers splayed out like that? Who puts their hands in their pockets that way? And why the hell are the paws of this bunny rabbit like splayed out like that? The way that their fingers are spread out, it's almost like, like they're pointing to something. <gasps> 
those digits point to the letters on the border. And that's why the kerning is so weird. Kit was literally squeezing and spacing the words so that the characters could point to the right letter. Okay, okay. But what about earlier with the fingers and the toes? Well, that pattern is how you accurately measure where the fingers point to. Remember the clue at the beginning of the book? To solve the hidden riddle, you must use your eyes. So we know to connect the character's eye first to their left finger, then their left toe, then their right toe, then finally their right finger. Assuming, of course, that the character has all four hands and feet visible. If a hand or a foot is obscured, you just skip it. And you're not just doing this with humans. You're doing this with every single living creature on the page. The mice, the bugs, the birds, all of it. And to make our lives slightly easier, Newton gives us the pattern of creatures. Humans, frogs, rabbits, birds, butterflies, fish, snails, and bugs. Yes, even snails are important to solving the puzzle. Now, there's one more puzzle square that's gonna help us put it all together, and it's etched in the sand on the last page. Using the sequence from the Penny Pocket Magic Square, we can find out how many letters we need to find per page. The number one on Penny Pocket matches with the number 10, meaning that the word will be 10 characters long. The numbers that are double digits do not mean that the word is 46 characters long. <laughs> That just means that there are two words, one that's four characters and one that's six characters. Okay, so now that we got that all the way, what the hell does it spell? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the answer. Catherine's long finger overshadows earth, buried yellow amulet, midday points the hour in light of equinox, look you. And there's actually a second message in this. When you look at the first letter of each word, you get close by Amped Hill. A. <laughs> but wait, there's even more clues that help us get even more precise. Going back to the Newton Square, those letters are actually the first letters of towns that are close by Amped Hill, and the numbers that correlate with them are the distances from Amped Hill in miles. Crazy. When we go to the moon and the sun dance page, we see the two characters point exactly to the spring equinox. Then on the first page, we have the phrase one of six to eight written at the bottom. This references Catherine of Aragon, the first of six wives to King Henry VIII. The bunny in the illustration is hidden in the hill, meaning that the treasure is buried in a hill. Amped hill. So all together, we learn that the treasure is buried at Amped Hill. You're to go to Catherine of Aragon's monument on the spring equinox, and when the clock strikes noon, go to the point of the monument's shadow and claim your treasure. Whew! <laughs> Crazy, right? All those clues, all that puzzling, and we get the perfect and precise location of the treasure. Absolutely fucking insane. But anyway, back to the story. Mike Barker and John Rousseau spent the better part of a year cracking this code. When they finally got it, Barker was like, let's go, let's go get this treasure. But Rousseau was a bit more reluctant. The first time they thought they cracked it, they ended up digging up mud in the freezing cold with no success. And because of that bad experience, he wanted to wait until they had cracked every little code, every little clue in the book, just to be 100% positive that they had indeed solved it. Remember, these are physics professors. This is in their wheelhouse. But again, Barker was hyped. So he ended up going there himself along with his family on January 4th, 1982. As 12 o'clock noon comes around at each longitudinal point on the Earth's Northern Hemisphere, shadows there point due north. At noon on any given date, in this case, the spring equinox, those shadows hit a precise and predictable length. Barker got his wife Celia to stand next to the cross so he could gauge its height, adjusted his sight and compasses reading by six degrees to compensate for the Earth's magnetic deviation, and worked out that the tip of the cross's shadow would fall about 20 feet from its base at Kit Williams' chosen hour. The ground north of the cross was on a slope though, and without more sophisticated instruments, he could only narrow the spot down so far. But who cares about his silly slope? He's a physicist! <laughs> He just has to put in a little bit more elbow grease and he's got his equations. So naturally, he and his family go home and he builds himself an inc inclinometer to calculate the perfect exact spot. And this, my dear friends, is where shit goes south. Introducing our villains. So obviously, Barker and Rousseau were not the only ones on the hunt for this hair. Let's meet some of our other hair hunters. John Gard was slim, blonde, and wore pinstripe suits. He was a vegetarian, an animal rights campaigner, an eco-campaigner, and worked as an advertising salesman for Bedfordshire on Sunday, which at the time was run by Frank Branston. Remember that name. 
Guard liked smoking weed and was one of those charming kinds of people who could hold a conversation with just about anyone. But beneath his charismatic persona was a very dodgy character. He was exposed by the Daily Mail some years earlier because he was with one of those companies which made money by enticing inadequate people to take a course that was supposed to fit them for the rougher world. It involved shouting at them and humiliating them and extracting money from them. So he was a fairly dodgy character, although by and large, fairly harmless. Next, we have his friend Eric Compton, who was a metal detector expert. The first time Compton had ever heard of Masquerade was in early 1981, when Guard asked if he could borrow some of Compton's equipment. Three days later, Guard returned the metal detectors and let Compton in on what he was up to. Later, Guard and Compton headed over to Veronica Roberts' house. She was a beautiful woman with long curly hair and brown eyes. Guard explained that he was living with Roberts and that because she used to date Kit Williams, she knew where the treasure was buried. The next night, Guard, Roberts, Compton, and Compton's 14-year-old son went on a moonlit escapade to Amptill and attempted to find the hair. Roberts showed the area where she believed the hair to be buried, and the men went to work digging a meter wide by meter deep hole, all the while scanning the soil with Compton's metal detector. I'd like to pause and remind everyone that the hair was inside a clay pot, specifically to prevent metal detectors from finding it. But even though this fact was very well known, and even though Roberts herself was holding an identical clay pot on this first escapade, they still, for some reason, were using metal detectors. I really don't understand why. I'd also like to mention that Roberts didn't 100% know where the hair was buried. She remembered having a picnic with Kit on the spring, spring equinox, and she remembered him leaving for a bit, which we now know was to bury a magnet for future reference, but she didn't see where he went off to. So even though she was a huge help for Garden Compton to find the general area, she couldn't pinpoint them to the precise spot. Anyway, after a long night of digging, they found nothing. They continued to dig night after night with Compton's son acting as like a lookout to warn for any intruders. They even went digging on the spring equinox in March of 1981, but still could not find the hair. Naturally, Roberts and Compton were starting to get frustrated. Guard kept Roberts happy by promising to sell the hair in the US and donate the money to an animal rights group, which was the only way that Roberts was ever going to be happy with this deal. She didn't really care about money for herself. And then Guard promised to pay Compton 1,000 pounds if he would serve as the public face for this discovery. Guard knew that the press would go crazy when the hair was finally found, and he didn't want reporters to sniff around and discover his connection to Roberts, which would naturally be a dead giveaway to their deceit. Compton, to his credit, was sick of guards bullshit by that point, and he backed out. That was in 1981. We now fast forward to February 18th, 1982, about one year later. Barker, armed with his homemade inclinometer, went back to Amtill and started digging at the mathematically calculated spot where the hair was buried. I dug a hole about two feet square and it was hard work. I was digging up little bits of tile and goodness knows what else. It wasn't easy digging, it was really tough, and I didn't find anything. I went down to arm's length and then I expanded the hole to about six by four. I was standing up to the waist in this big grave-like hole. After two to three hours of fruitless digging, Barker gave up and headed home, committed to come back on the actual equinox and unearth this worryingly elusive hair. The next day, Garb went over to Compton's house, yelling and banging on the door. Eric, you've been there. You found the hair. You've taken it. I said, John, I've not been up there. Guard had seen the freshly dug earth left over by Barker the day before and was freaking out about someone finding the treasure before him. He took me up to Amtill Park to show me the area of the freshly dug soil, Compton recalled. I said, John, we already dug that area up a long time ago, down to about three feet. He started shouting, well, who does have it then? Time was running out for Guard. He had to find this goddamn rabbit before this mysterious person stole his treasure. Now, I want to pause for a second to address something. How is it that all of these men, including a literal physicist with an inclinometer, did all this digging and still had not found the hair? Like, Condon and Guard not finding it, sure, they were mostly just guessing, but Barker? How could he have missed it? Well, there are two possible explanations and you're not gonna like either of them. The first explanation has to do with the clay pot the hair was kept in. The pot was kind of small and happened to be the same color as the dirt beneath Amptill. Add to the fact that all of these men were digging under the cover of night and it's likely that they literally just missed it. They may have dug it up and reburied it without realizing. The second explanation makes me want to scream. 
Kit Williams is not a physicist. He did not bury the hair based on mathematical calculations. He, like anyone else in his shoes, waited until the spring equinox to find the shadow point and bury his magnet. But here's the thing that kills me. The day that Kit buried that magnet, it was overcast. (laughs) There wasn't a clean shadow on the ground, so it's very well possible that Kit buried it in the wrong fucking spot. (gasps) Kit! (laughs) But either way, the hair had not been found. It's February 19th, 1982. Guard has to claim his prize, but he still doesn't even know where the goddamn bunny is. So what does he do? Our final villain. That same day, Kit Williams gets a letter in the mail. It read, Dear Mr. Williams, Please excuse me from not writing in my address, but if I am correct about the whereabouts of the hair and this letter fell in the wrong hands, all my efforts over the past 18 months would be for nothing if I were to be followed to the site and it's difficult enough with it being a public place. I believe the hair to be in this area. Beneath that text was a crudely drawn map of Amtil, depicting the rugby field of the Frogstone and Catherine's Cross. Pointing to the shadow of the cross was the word hair. The letter resumed. If I am correct, you will recognize the sketch. If I am not correct, I would like to know as the digging is very hard and I have spent far too much time searching for the hair you can reach me at, insert telephone number here, please transfer the charge and ask for Ken. Yours faithfully, Ken. P.S. It was also very hard to locate you. P.P.S. Have many other clues as well as sketch. Now, maybe it's just me. But this letter comes off as awfully (laughs) passive-aggressive. But whatever. Who cares? We finally have our winner! Finally, after two and a half long years, we finally have a submission that points to the prize. So, Kit goes running to the phone and tells Thomas, You've got it! But instead of any kind of jubilant response, Thomas just sounds kind of annoyed. He told Kit that it was a crappy day and he had a cold and he absolutely was not going to go out and dig up the hair with him. No thanks. So naturally, that made Kit more than a bit suspicious. So as they kept talking, Kit is trying very hard to not give anything away and to also see just how much Ken Thomas knew about the puzzle. Turns out, very little. He's got this vague, flimsy story about how he was taking his dog out on a walk in Amtil, and at some point the dog pees on a rock, and as he's peeing, Thomas looks over at the Catherine of Aragon statue, and he remembers the one of six to eight line and connects it with Henry VIII's wives, and somehow magically pieced it all together, which obviously was not at all how the puzzle was supposed to be solved. So now Kit is getting a little cagey and is actually trying to backtrack him saying that Thomas was a winner. He essentially tells Thomas that the winner still needed to dig up the hair, which is a complete lie, but you know what? This is a weird situation, right? But at that point, Kit had already slipped just enough details for Thomas to get a slightly more precise location of the hair. The next day, February 20th, Thomas goes digging specifically around the spot where Barker had dug since, you know, the ground was clearly mussed up and this other guy seemingly had the right idea. But still, nothing. He digs again on the 21st, nothing. Again on the 22nd, nothing. After three nights of digging, Thomas calls Kit complaining about how he hadn't found the hair. This, of course, freaked Kit out, and he told Thomas that if the hair wasn't there, then clearly it had been stolen and that they needed to tell the press. But in telling Thomas, oh shit, what do you mean the hair isn't there? He basically confirmed for Thomas the exact place to be digging. Oh my God, Kit. So Thomas, with this valuable information, tells Kit not to go to the press just yet and then goes back to Amtil on February 24th and finally digs up the goddamn hair. He calls Kit and leaves a voicemail saying he found the hair. Kit calls back the next day asking to meet up. And then Thomas just ghosts him for seven fucking days. Meanwhile, our lovely publisher Mashler was sweating. Because Thomas was ghosting them, they couldn't announce to the world that the hair had been found. They were just sitting ducks. And to make matters worse, Jonathan Cape, the publishing house, was in the works of publishing a paperback version of Masquerade that had all of the solutions and everything in it. They were trying to perfectly time the winner announcement with the book being published to maximize the amount of press and excitement in sales. But freaking Thomas was nowhere to be found. But finally, finally, 
He resurfaces and asks to meet Kit and Mashler in person to hash out the details. Suddenly, we were into this detective story. He had specified we had to go to this hotel to meet him and see the jewel. My wife, myself, and the publisher, no one else whatsoever, no journalist or anybody. When we arrived there, we went to the reception and they said, oh yes, there's a letter waiting here for you. He had a friend waiting in this hotel who was looking out to see us coming across the car park that there were just the three of us. And we were then sent to another hotel and it just went on and on like this. When they finally did meet, Thomas told them that his name, Ken Thomas, was an alias to protect his privacy. He also refused to tell his real name and insisted that his dog also have an alias. Thomas didn't want anything to do with the press, but after much negotiating, he finally agreed to one television interview and one paper interview. At the paper interview, which was the unveiling of the golden hair, Thomas showed up in a full disguise. Dressed like a homeless person with his cap pulled low enough to cover his eyes, Thomas kept his back to the photographers at every opportunity and refused to say anything the entire time. Then later at the television interview, he insisted on being filmed from behind a frosted glass and even had his voice electronically altered. Again, just like on the phone with Kit, he gives the same vague dodgy story about how he found this hair. This could not possibly have been a bigger letdown. Kit and Mashler and Kate, they wanted to make a celebrity out of the winner, and instead they get this stubborn asshole who refuses to show his face and also, dickishly, turn down the Victoria and Albert Museum's request to temporarily display the hair so that the public could see it in person. May I remind you that people had technically seen the hair in photographs and on TV when the book was first published, and they saw it again in the newspapers at the unveiling, but no one in the whole world had actually gotten the chance to see this treasure with their own two eyes. Two and a half years of puzzle solving around the world, all this pent up excitement, and they don't even get to see it firsthand. And for extra salt in the wounds, Thomas' story was all about his dog peeing on a rock in Amtill. It made a complete mockery out of all of treasure hunters like Barker and Rousseau, who had genuinely spent years trying to solve the puzzle. This was a crushing disappointment, and it completely soured the end of what should have been the most thrilling and magical treasure hunt of the ages. And because Thomas was so goddamn fishy, people seriously believed that there was foul play. Some thought that it was Kit himself behind the glass. Others looked at Kit Williams' name and realized it anagrammed, conveniently, to I Will Mask It. And you know, when the book itself is called Masquerade, meeting a false show or pretense, you get a lot of people who thought the whole thing was fake. It gets worse. I hate this. I, you're not gonna like this. So, on the evening of Sunday, March 14th, Celia, Barker's wife, calls him over to the living room. That night, the BBC announced that Ken Thomas was the official winner of the masquerade treasure hunt. In total shock, Barker watches the aerial footage of Ant Hill, which showed the hole he himself dug a few weeks prior. The most awful thing for me was that somebody had cracked the puzzle and got there before us. That was the key thing. Not necessarily that they had got the hair. I wasn't too bothered about that. I wanted precedence on solving that puzzle for my sake and John's. Devastated, he phones Rousseau and tells him, bad news. The next morning, Barker wrote to Cape with a letter for them to forward to Kit. This letter went into painstaking detail of how the puzzle is solved, outlining step by step the correct solution. Cape received the letter, but they didn't immediately send it to Kit. They already had their winner, so there wasn't any need to rush the letters to Kit anymore. After a few days, Barker's sister managed to find Kit's address in a library directory because 80s. Barker at this point is determined, so he orders a telegram to Kit that read, close by Amt Hill, which as you'll remember was the big final cipher of the puzzle. There was no way you could come up with that phrase if you hadn't properly solved it. So the second Kit saw the telegram, he knew that Barker and Rousseau had cracked it, and a few days later when Cape finally dropped off their letter, Kit had full proof that Barker and Rousseau were the actual proper winners of the masquerade treasure hunt. But by that point, there was nothing he could do. Ken Thomas had been declared the winner a week ago, and the golden hair was locked away in a bank somewhere. Nothing could be done, and the memory of masquerade faded away. Until six years later. A new game. A couple years after winning the hair, Ken Thomas used the treasure to receive a bank loan, which he then used to fund a new video game company called Hairsoft. 
you are not gonna like where this is going. Hairsoft was basically trying to capitalize on the success of Masquerade by completely ripping it off. The company announced that they'd be releasing two video games, Hair Razor Prelude and Hair Razor Finale, which were two halves of a new hair-finding treasure hunt. The announcement marked the beginning of a new hunt for the hair, or if the winner preferred, she could take 30,000 pounds in cash in lieu of the hair, that being, according to Hairsoft, its estimated value as a piece of art and a cultural touchstone after all of the Masquerade excitement. The hair wasn't actually buried this time. To avoid damaging the countryside and to give an equal chance to young people who cannot travel freely. All you needed to find it in virtual space was patience and an inquisitive mind for a puzzle that could be solved by adult and child alike. The first problem was the price. Each game was an insane amount of money for the time, and you had to buy both in order to solve the puzzle. The second problem was the decision to split the game in the first place. Why wasn't there a middle? Could it possibly be just a thinly veiled cash grab? <sighs> And the third and most damning problem was the game itself. Hair Razor Prelude, which was released first, was a threadbare, ugly, poorly executed, and completely incomprehensible game, if you could even call it that. I have a couple links to videos of the game and like a roast of the game down in the description box, but here's a clip so that you get the gist. That is the entire game. Graphics and gameplay and many other things aside, the whole point of this game was to be a treasure hunt and that the text and imagery were clues to find an actual treasure. But unlike Masquerade, which is so rich in detail and has layers upon layers of visual and textual information, this piece of shit told you nothing. <laughs> Some people have actually attempted to figure it out, again, description, but you get nowhere because there's nowhere to go. So Hair Razor Prelude comes out and it gets trash reviews. Not only that, but the game and the company behind it seemed super shady. For one thing, how did this brand spanking new company have 30,000 pounds to give away as a prize? And another, if you disassemble the program itself, you'll find that there's no windscreen. There's no way for the computer to confirm if you've won or not, meaning that Hairsoft could literally declare an arbitrary solution to an arbitrary winner whenever they best could maximize publicity and profit. A few months later, when Hair Razor Finale came out, which by the way, is almost identical to the prelude, people outright ignored it. It wasn't even worth the time to leave a bad review. At this point, Hairsoft was starting to get a little desperate, so they wrote their own positive reviews and published them in the newspapers to try and drum up more sales. This tactic maybe could have worked if the reviews themselves hadn't sounded so ludicrously fake. A Mrs. Widowson wrote, I wonder who these nerds are who think this isn't any good. I am one of a group of six who have had immense fun from seeking clues on this treasure hunt. And furthermore, it's not meant to be a book like Masquerade. If one seeks to win the golden hair, the computer gives the clues. The rest is down to you. That is, if you're intelligent enough. So naturally, Hairsoft fails. <laughs> the company disappeared in early 1985, having never declared a winner or given the puzzle solution. And that should have been the end of that, but the real bombshell was about to go off. Scandal revealed. It is now December 1988. Because Hairsoft didn't make nearly enough money to pay back their loan, the company and its assets were now being liquidated and auctioned off, which meant, in plain English, that the golden hair was now for sale. That's right, six years after Ken Thomas was declared the winner of Masquerade and six years after he snubbed the world by not showing off the treasure, the golden hair was not only back in the public eye, but was also, once again, up for grabs. Except this time, you didn't need to dig. <laughs> you just needed a big fat wad of cash. <laughs> Kit Williams actually showed up to the auction and bid himself, but he had to back out at 6,000 pounds. The hair finally sold at 31,900 pounds, 10 times more than its original stated value, to a family that remains anonymous. We do know, however, that the man who bought the hair got it as a Christmas present for his wife. The family lives in Egypt, and the wife wears the golden hair every Christmas. Anyway, 
The hair being sold garnered a lot of publicity, but it also put Hairsoft and Ken Thomas back in the limelight, which was the perfect opportunity to do a little investigating. And lo and behold, on December 11th, just six days after the hair was sold, the scandal was finally revealed. And who did the revealing? Why, none other than Frank Branston. You know, the editor of Bedfordshire and Sunday? The paper that John Gard worked for? <laughs> Well, back in 1981, a year before the treasure was found, Branston was chatting with Guard, who, out of the blue, told him that he thought he knew where the hair was buried. Naturally, Branston was like, how the hell do you know this? And Guard said, his girlfriend, Veronica Roberts, used to be Kit's girlfriend, and she knew where the hair was buried. I don't understand how dumb this guy is that he's just telling everyone about this plan, but whatever. He clearly wasn't very bright, but also, he wasn't a really trustworthy character, so no one fully believed what he said anyway, including Branston. But what Guard said did pique Branston's curiosity, so he did some digging, and sure enough, Veronica Roberts did in fact date Kit when he was creating Masquerade. So when Ken Thomas came forward as the winner of the hair, Branston was like, that's gotta be Guard, except that it obviously wasn't. Even with his heavy disguise, Branston could tell that this guy definitely wasn't Guard. So who was he? Branston hit a dead end in 1982, but now, in 1988, with details about Hairsoft coming out, he decided to take another look. He went through the company's records and discovered that the name of Hairsoft's director was not Ken Thomas, which we know is an alias, but Dougal Thompson, a man who conveniently lived 15 miles away from Amptill. After so many years of secrecy, we finally have Thomas's real name. Branston looked deeper into Dougal Thompson's history and discovered that he was once the co-director of a barely even a company company called Clayprint, and Clayprint was set up by none other than John Gard. So now finally we have our story. Veronica Roberts, former girlfriend of Kit Williams, dated John Gard and told him where the hair was buried. In an effort to claim the hair without anyone discovering his connection with Roberts, Gard used his business partner and fellow con man, Dougal Thompson, to be the fake winner and cover all of Gard's tracks. This is like the bare bones of the story, but there are still a ton of details that remain unexplained. After discovering all of this, Branston cornered Gard and Thompson for a confession, but neither gave much information. We don't know the details of their partnership, where they were working together the whole time? Or did Thompson find the hair and Guard weasel his way into the scheme? And what about the timing of the letter to Kit? It's highly suspicious that the same day Guard discovered Barker had been digging at Amtill the night before, Kit got a letter from Ken Thomas. Was Thompson trying to con Guard out of the hair? Who knows? In the decades since the scandal, nothing else has ever been cleared up. John Guard straight up died. <laughs> thanks to all of the drinking and drugs. Veronica Roberts disappeared. Eric Compton has been interviewed, but his memory is fuzzy and he never really got to see the coalition between Guard and Thompson anyway. And Thompson still has not said a peep due to legal reasons, which for once may actually be the truth. But now, with this information out in the open, the public breathed a sigh of relief. There was a kind of global satisfaction and vindication that everyone's suspicions had been confirmed. Kit, on the other hand, wasn't so happy to hear the news. The day after Branson's article was published, another article came out with Kit's reaction to the news. This tarnishes Masquerade, and I am shocked by what has emerged. I never really believed that he, Thomas, had solved the puzzle, but I had no proof. This new evidence convinces me. Barker and Rousseau were also interviewed, and when asked if they felt cheated, Barker replied, A bit, wouldn't you? 30 years later, there is a tiny happy ending to this story. In 2009, Paul Slade, one of my primary sources for this video, worked with the BBC to create a documentary celebrating the 30th anniversary of Masquerade. Because no one knew where the hair was, Barker suggested writing an appeal for the owner of the hair to lend it for a brief exhibition. As luck would have it, the granddaughter of the owner saw the article and agreed to display the hair. Reuniting with his beloved hair was a very emotional moment for Kit, and we actually have it on video. That's very emotional, really. In a way, it was like an apprentice piece. I, I made it because I was almost no one going, going nowhere. And then I made this thinking, this is something really special. And it, and it turned out that way. And I'm, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by it to see it again. 
Once the hair was verified, it was brought to Portal Gallery to be the centerpiece for Kit's newest exhibition. Kit told no one that the hair was going to be there. This was all set up as one big public surprise. It was also the first time in decades that Kit had shown his personal work, let alone be in the public eye, which those two facts alone was enough to attract hundreds of people. The BBC invited Barker and Rousseau and their families to the grand opening, while deliberately not telling them about the big reveal. Unfortunately, Barker couldn't make it. He and his wife Celia had promised to look after his sister after she had had an operation. But the BBC dropped some pretty heavy hints and then finally outright told Barker that the hair was gonna be there, but Barker couldn't be convinced. He did, however, keep the secret to himself so that Rousseau could enjoy the big surprise. And then Rousseau almost didn't go because Barker wasn't going, but Barker was just kind of persuaded him into going along with his family. These two are just great friendship. <laughs> I'll let Slade and Barker describe what happens next. When John reached the gallery, he, like everyone else, saw only William's latest paintings and a shrouded glass display cabinet in the middle of the room. The instant Kit went over to that cabinet, I knew the hair would be in it, he told me. I experienced a great wave of emotion when I thought of all the happy times my family and Mike and Celia had chasing the thing and how much my late wife Sheila would have loved to have seen it. BBC Four's footage of this moment shows William standing next to the shrouded cabinet, calling for a hush, and then giving his guests a quick reminder of the hair's history. A member of the family, who now own it, contacted the radio program and said, We have it, he announces. It's on the other side of the world. So yesterday, it arrived by airplane, and, whipping back the cloth, tomorrow it goes back. The camera zooms in to frame Rousseau's face as he leans forward to see the prize, which had eluded him for so long. He looks close to tears. It's just a bit of metal, after all, but uh, it represented something quite enormous. The only thing I regret in the 30 years since then and now is not having seen it. And I've seen it, and I'm so grateful. I was touched by the generosity of the hair's owners in responding to my appeal on the radio program and allowing it to come to the portal, Barker added later. As for not seeing the hair personally, well, I told the lady from the BBC that I wasn't particularly interested in jewelry, but more interested in puzzles. That's still true, and I would dearly love to know for sure when exactly that hair came out of the ground. Even more treasure. That concludes the main story, but there's actually more treasure to be had. A year after the winner of Masquerade was declared, Kit set out to make a new puzzle book. This was most likely due to pressure from his publishers, but I like to believe that he just wanted a second shot at making something fun and wonderful for people to enjoy. Generally referred to as the B-Book or Untitled, the goal of this book is simply to figure out what the title is. No crazy treasure map, no midnight digging, no coordinates, just solve the title. The competition ran for a year and one day, and instead of writing out your answer, you had to create something that revealed the title without using the written word. Kit would then pick the winner who had the most imaginative submission. This made Kit's mailbox considerably lighter, and meant that each solution was special and meaningful. The prize was a stunning mahogany box guarded by a solid gold queen bee. Inside the box was the one and only copy of the book with the title on the cover. On May 25th, 1985, Kit announced the winner on the TV show Wogan. Wagen? Not sure. The winner was Steve Pierce, who created a large blue cabinet with a handle and window to see an illustration. When the handle was turned, the answer was revealed. Kit, of course, also revealed the grand prize, which involved removing a piece of beeswax in order to open the box. Unfortunately, <laughs> under the hot studio lights, the wax melted just enough to make it stuck, but hey, what's a Kit Williams treasure hunt without a few hiccups, am I right? <laughs> I haven't revealed the title in this video just in case you want to solve it yourself, but I'm here to warn you that in finding this book, you will probably have the title spoiled. Obviously, the title's been known for a very long time and libraries and online stores need the title to catalog it, but I figured there had to be at least one puzzle in this video for you to solve yourself. Conclusion. I actually had a copy of this book as a kid, and I remember being so utterly fascinated by the illustrations and also so fucking frustrated because I couldn't solve any of the riddles in the story. And truth be told, I still can't, at least without a little bit of help from the internet. Uh, fast forward to early 2017, I was in the Mass Art Library and I spotted this book. And even though I didn't remember what the name of the book was, I saw the cover and I was like, holy shit, that's the book. So as I'm pouring over the book, that's when I finally see the little paragraph about the masquerade treasure hunt. And I just start freaking out. So then I start going to the rabbit hole to learn about how the puzzle was solved and the solution and all the little secrets and all the red herrings and the illustrations. and. 
it was incredible, but I just kind of kept the story to myself. Just kind of sat on it, enjoyed it, and moved on. Fast forward to 2020, I'm trying to think of YouTube ideas and I realize, oh, wait a second, this might be a good video idea. So I go back into the rabbit hole and this time I found out all the drama with Guard and Thompson and Barker and Rousseau and Hairsoft and I just, I just can't believe how big the story behind this book is. There's so much. And even though I tried to be thorough in this video essay, there are still so many details and stories that I had to leave out. Please, if you have the time, go down to the description box. There are tons of articles and interviews and videos and so many little things that are worth exploring. Kit Williams is an incredible artist, an absolute genius, a wacko. <laughs> this book sparked a whole new genre of books called armchair treasure hunts, but none have quite reached the caliber or success of Masquerade. So I guess the takeaway I have is to not shy away from challenges. Kit wanted nothing to do with children's books, and yet, because of that prompt, he created something the world had never seen before. Something so incredible and insane that a 25-year-old YouTuber is making an hour-long video. <laughs> But you know, humor aside, this book has been very inspiring for me. I hope it was inspiring for you. And I'll see you in the next video, guys. See you later. Bye.